Good morning, guys. Uh, just enjoying a warm morning in the house. It's really frosty outside. I'm taking the day off from hunting again um, to work on spirituality. And I really want to talk about what the, the importance of Scott Peck's work. You guys know that I'm reading this series. Uh, it starts with The Road Less Traveled, and we are on the second book, which is further along, The Road Less Traveled. Both of these books are filled with um, small sections, two or three pages, and then, you know, it's a, it's a new topic every two or three pages, and then there's chapters which have overlying themes that are discussed through varying topics, okay? So this second book says the edited lectures, and I was like, oh, what am I getting into? But it's, it's not. It's the same format as the first book. It is filled with invaluable spiritual growth, life-inducing wonder, inducing stuff okay if you're not aware of what gary thinks of this guy's work i think he was a genius i really do he talks about so many things um things that have touched me because i've gone through this process now it started when i was 36 my my spirituality my search for spirituality okay the the idea of me identifying that there has to be more to life and going from there into my search your search will probably consist of a lot of the same things, but you could be off doing your own tangent, whatever that is that's interesting to you. He talks about the steps and processes. He talks about mental health. He was a psychologist. Um, he died at an early age, 65, I believe. And I wonder if it was from taking on all of this stuff, you know, a lifetime of working with people, helping them with their issues, I honestly don't think that a person can do that, work in those fields, and not take some of that on themselves. I think his work has meaning, has value, is real, and I can see the stages that I've gone through in my spiritual journey exactly as he points out in The Road Less Traveled. There are four stages according to, to Dr. Peck. The first stage is chaotic, restless abandon, right? The kids are in this stage, children are in this stage. This is the stage where people are egotistical, the world revolves around themselves, uh, nobody else's will manners, there is no empathy, it is me, me, me. The child stage, stage one. Stage two is where the children move into adolescence and blind faith follows, right? Um, your parents, authoritative figures, teachers, religious figures, we follow them blindly. They are teaching us, they are telling us what they're telling us has to be true, right? There is good, there is evil, there is right and wrong. And through shame and fear, we are coerced into falling into a, a system uh, that we are led down by authoritative figures and we follow it blindly. Stage three, the stage of scientific skepticism and knowledge. Um, I actually... I think I was a little later going through these stages than some people. Why I can relate is I went through stage one, through stage two. Stage three came for me when I went back to school to do a BSc in my late 20s. I was 27 and I just decided that technology and logic were going to give me the answers that I needed and I had to think for myself and proof was needed for answers. And stage three for me lasted from about 27 till 36 and then I entered stage four. Stage four is where a person starts to enjoy the mystery and beauty of nature uh, in existence. You retain skepticism but you begin to see patterns in nature and things around you. You begin to notice little miracles and pay attention to these things. A new spirituality um, is found. Compassion, forgivingness, mercy, uh, love expansion, a feeling of connectedness. No longer through blind faith or fear do we believe what we are told, but through genuine belief, we begin to see that there is more to the universe. Uh, we accept that people can, can and should be forgiven. We love ourselves deeper, and we therefore love others deeper. And Scott referred to this stage as uh, people in this stage as mystics. Now, I am not a mystic by any means, but I honestly believe 
I am somewhere in that lower level of stage four because I am definitely past the scientific stage. I am I'm opening up and I agree with all of those things. Compassion, love, mercy, connectedness, mystery, um, and, and a desire to search out mystery is another part of this stage where we, we're not closed-minded. We have addressed looking at the things we believed and challenging those beliefs and anything that didn't stack up we then accept that there could be another answer and we go looking for it. That is part of spiritual growth, right? This is, this is the stage I'm at. I feel blessed that I'm doing this at 45. Honestly, had you guys asked me, you know, two or three years ago, I'd be like, yeah, I'm feeling kind of old, right? Put on a few pounds, uh, don't run 20K a week anymore. I had to take a day off hunting today because my back hurts. <laughs> But when I look at it in the grand scheme of things, for me to be at this level that I'm at right now, I'm still young. I could have another good 40 years and develop this level that I'm on right now. Where am I going to be in 10 years, let alone in 40, right? If I can understand and accept these things now, I have so much hope for the future, guys, for, for myself, for my own growth. I think I'm definitely heading down the right path. So there are two things I want to touch on specifically from this book, okay? I want you guys to buy this book and read it. If you haven't read The Road Less Traveled, buy and read that book first, okay? Um, if any of the things that I have talked about, any of the words that I've used spark an interest in you, right? Spiritual growth, compassion, love, uh, you know, expanding of your understanding. That's what this whole process is, right? He's teaching us how to do this. And why I find it fascinating, why I'm giving him so much credit is because I have come to a lot of these terms and understanding on my own before reading his work. I consider myself a pretty smart guy, um, pretty accomplished guy, and that's not to toot my own horn, but if you can't trust somebody, you know, trust yourself. And I know that my own journey has taken me down. I've discovered a lot of the same things that he's saying. He's much more organized and identifies exactly the process and the steps, and uh, he knows the psychology behind it. I don't. So you put those two together, Gary bumbling around in his own spirituality, hitting upon these things and saying, yeah, there's something to this, there's something to that. How it all goes together, I don't know. He tells us how it goes together. So I'm gonna, I wanna read a passage, one page from this book, and now, and it may not be the most uh, enlightening thing for you, but for me, it was. This was a huge part of Gary's journey. When I turned 36, gave up the career, hit that depression, and all I could think about was, what have I done with my life? Where am I going? I've given up a bigger part of myself, and uh, what is my legacy? And, and, and for all the wrong reasons, I went into that depression thinking, you know, I have amounted to nothing to this point. I have degrees on the wall. I've done this, this, and this in terms of jobs and goals, but it doesn't really mean anything. There has to be more to life. And so for me, there was a great fear of death. And I've said that before on the channel, ever since I was a little kid. Now you have to stop and think, why would a little kid fear death? But I did. I remember being five or six years old and, and maybe a pet died or something. Maybe I just didn't understand it. I don't know. But there was always a great fear of death. My best friend died when I was 18. And that kind of compounded, you know, that inspired and pushed me to go and achieve all of these physical things, degrees and jobs and um, marks in school, right? Be the best. And I, I don't know why, okay? That's its, its own psychological thing, right? That achieve as much as you can while you're here. But then you realize when you begin to, to grow spiritually and see, those are the wrong things to be, to, to be working on. Love, compassion, joy, looking for miracles, the connectedness, those are the things that we should be working on, but you don't see that when you're in your early 20s. Anyway, for me, death, okay? And I wanna read one page out of here, and this may click with some of you, some of you it may not, but there are 240 other pages in here that I guarantee you will find something that will connect with you, okay? So, and I'm not associated with any, I don't get anything from, uh, so anyone who's thinking, ah, oh, Gary's pushing, I'm pushing this for your own spiritual growth, and mine. I'm super enjoying uh, this series. So I want to read one page, this section, on death and why it is important, okay? Fear of death and narcissism. 
But why are we so often excessively afraid of death? It is primarily because of our narcissism. Narcissism is an extraordinary complex phenomenon. Some of it is necessary as a psychological side of our survival instinct, but most of it past childhood is self-destructive. Unbridled narcissism is a principal precursor of the psycho-spiritual illness. The healthy spiritual life consists in a progressive growing out of narcissism. And while the failure to grow out of it is extremely common, it is also extremely destructive. Why psychiatrists talk about injuries to pride, we call them narcissistic injuries. And on any scale of narcissistic injuries, death is the ultimate. We suffer little narcissistic injuries all the time. A classmate calls us stupid, for example. We're the last to be chosen for someone's volleyball team. Colleges turn us down. Employers criticize us. We get fired. Our children reject us. As a result of these narcissistic injuries, either we become embittered or we grow. I know a few that have become embittered. But death is the big one. Nothing threatens our narcissistic attachment to ourselves and our self-conceit more than our impending obliteration. So it is utterly natural that we should fear death. There are two ways to deal with the fear, the common way and the smart way. The common way is to put it out of our mind, limit our awareness of it and try not to think about it. That tends to work fine when you're young. But the longer we put it off, the closer it gets, and after a while, everything begins to become a reminder of death. The graduation of a child, the illness of a friend, the creak in a joint. In other words, the common way is not very smart. In fact, the more we put off facing our death, the more frightening our old age is going to be. I believe that 100%. I put it off for years by achieving all of these earthly goals that I had set, right? The school, the work, the going up the corporate ladder. It was all just a way to put off thinking about what was slowly happening, right? And then it slaps you in the face one day and you realize, I'm doing this all wrong. And he's stating that right here, right? This is a professional psychiatrist stating what I went through and came to learn on my own. So there is merit here for some of us. Maybe it doesn't apply to all of us, but for me and a few others, it will. The smart way is to face death as early as possible. And in doing so, we can realize something really rather simple. And that is, insofar as we can overcome our narcissism, and we can probably never do this totally, we can overcome our fear of death. For people who succeed at this, the prospect of death becomes a magnificent stimulus for their psychological and spiritual growth. Since I'm going to die anyway, they think, what's the point of preserving this attachment I have to my silly old self? And so they set forth on a journey towards selflessness. And we've talked about that. The ultimate goal is love and selflessness. And I think this last paragraph here on this section on death pretty much sums up what we need to know. It is not an easy journey, but what a worthwhile journey it is. Because the further we proceed in diminishing our narcissism, our self-centeredness, and sense of self-importance, the more we discover ourselves becoming not only less fearful of death, but also less fearful of life. And we become more loving. No longer burdened by the need to protect ourselves, we are able to lift our eyes off of ourselves and truly recognize others. And we begin to experience a sustained underlying kind of happiness. Uh, what have I been saying in the last six videos? <laughs> we, that we have never experienced before as we become progressively more self-forgetful and hence more able to remember God. So I have contemplated that the whole point of being here might be as simple as just experiencing the earthly realm and that this is some kind of adventure and that mystery is a huge part of it. Um, because I, I just feel if you knew everything, if we are in heaven or wherever we go and we know everything, we're part of the oneness, right? That people talk about, we know everything. It, you would have to experience everything to get to that point. We talked about that in a previous video. I, I would believe that, and it was mentioned in The Road Less Traveled, after we talked about it, Gary came to that conclusion, then read about it in Scott Peck's first book, which was the whole point of going through uh, repeated trips and visits here and learning would be that eventually you would become godlike, right? Once you become godlike, that's a scary thing because you would know everything, right? But to get to that point, you would have to experience everything. And then to say that, and we're getting a little deep here, but then to say that once you reach that point that there is no further evolution, we don't know that either. 
Could God, spirituality, the universe, the greater power, could it be evolving? I would think it would have to evolve all the time, right? I don't know. It's too deep of a thought to get into. But the point is the next section in the book was mystery and spirituality. If you don't have a desire to look for mystery and challenge your assumptions in life and go out and and admit, I don't know how this works. I don't understand how that works. I don't understand this. It could be a small topic or a huge, you know, religion. It could be spirituality. It could be the universe. It could be something huge, right? Mathematics. Whatever it is, we have to first admit we don't understand that and then learn a little bit about it. We can never learn everything there is to know. Not in this state. Not in this human form. I consider myself an intellect and I've forgotten more than I know right now. <laughs> I'll tell you that. But the point is, you have to have that desire to grow and a curiosity within yourself. And if you don't, then you're probably not long for this world. That is not from the book. That is my thought process on that. You need something to keep you here. And again, I think that is, in a way, pointing to the reality, the truth of it, that we have a choice. We have chosen to be here. If Gary had to script his perfect journey... It would include not knowing, right? It would include difficulty. It would include things not coming easy and a progression towards getting easier over time, a progression towards spirituality over time. When I sit and evaluate myself, you, you really need to truly know yourself. And I think myself, if we looked at this as just a simulation or a game, Gary would say, hey, this is how I would have scripted it. And in the end, I've told my wife, she thinks I'm nuts, but I said one of two things is going to happen. I'm either just going to, boom, die and wake up still alive, still Gary in some spiritual form and go, wow, that was totally amazing. Or I'm not going to die because when I turn 90, they're going to come out with some kind of injection that turns you back to your kid. Eh? And life will carry on. That's Gary's perfect endings. I've thought about it, guys. So what's your perfect ending? I don't know. There is a continuation of self. I will never lose myself. That is, that is another fear that I think a lot of us carry on is uh, maybe not death, but the death of consciousness, the death of me, right? I might not fear physical death, but I, all of us, I'm pretty sure, unless there's something wrong with you, fear the loss of our identity, right? So in my perfect world, that's not going to happen. Now, could I be completely wrong? My grandmother would tell you yes when she was here. So I've, I've had a dream where grandma told me there was more. I met her. You know, she was still alive and young on the steamboat. We talked about this. But when she was here, my grandmother always said, have a beer. You're not going to know about it. Don't worry about it. Don't waste your life worrying because she totally 100% believed there is no afterlife. There is nothing. We're just biological forms. And when we die, we die. That's it. And that's what grandma believed. And um, I think she's wrong because if I'm writing the script, Grandma, you're wrong. What do you guys think? Let me know below. Remember, Scott Peck, Road Less Traveled. There's a trilogy. I forget the name of the third book. I've got it. It's on the shelf. We're going to read it next. Brilliant man. Thanks for watching.